How would you advise a targeted parent to seek help legally, practically? Um, in your estimation, what percentage of children go on to figure this out? So if you had to pick the number one thing that you believe can wake the public up to this, what, what do you think it would be? Welcome to the Anti-Alienation Project. I'm Maddie. I talk about all things related to parental alienation. I was an alienated child for 20 years from my dad. I figured everything out last year. And since then, I've been doing advocacy work basically for these children going through it, as well as adult children who haven't figured it out yet. Today, I have a very special guest to introduce you to. His name is Dr. William Burnett. Dr. Burnett is one of the leading specialists on parental alienation in not only United States, but also worldwide. Dr. Burnett is a professor and a researcher at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, but he has also testified as an expert in forensic psychiatry 300 times in 24 states. He is the founder and the first president of the Parental Alienation Study Group, which is an international non-for-profit corporation with 800 members. I'm so fond of him and his research. In fact, it was Dr. Burnett that devised the five-factor model for understanding and identifying parental alienation. His research is 100% spot on to my own experience, so I know that he really gets it. He has also been really involved in trying to get parental alienation into the DSM. In 2008, he recommended that the DSM include parental alienation disorder. Dr. Burnett has really dedicated his life's work to fighting parental alienation, and I am so honored to be able to air this episode for you today. So hi, Dr. Burnett, and welcome to the Anti-Alienation Project. I'm honored to have the opportunity to interview you today. As a for formerly alienated child myself, I appreciate your work from a personal point of view. Figuring out the truth is devastating and traumatic, but to know that there are experts out there and people out there fighting to protect kids that are going through it just like I was means a lot to me. And I really appreciate it. So I just want to start with saying thank you. Um, Great, Madison. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So I can imagine that in this line of work, it must be frustrating or maybe difficult at times to exist in a sphere that is inundated with misinformation, false allegations, and claims that parental alienation is junk science or pseudoscience. It seems to me that in order to maintain a career in this field, one must feel truly passionate and be driven by an inner conviction or motivation. And so to that end, I'm curious um, to know why you do what you do, why you choose to fight parental alienation. Well, it started uh, when I was working as a child psychiatrist uh, and I did counseling and therapy for children and adolescents and families. And I also did... Uh, custody evaluations. You know, sometimes when people go to court, the attorneys ask a psychiatrist or a psychologist to do a custody evaluation. So I, I did a number of those. And so it was in that context that I discovered, uh, or I, I observed, I didn't really create it or discover it, but I observed uh, parental alienation in a few of the families that I had been evaluating. And so that intrigued me. And then I got involved with organizations, uh, child psychiatry organizations that published uh, guidelines on how to do evaluations and, and how to recognize parental alienation. And so that really got me interested. And I suppose what really got me really involved was when the DSM was being uh, revised. Um, I was invited to submit uh, a proposal to the DSM-5 uh, people regarding parental alienation because nobody else had done that and they told me that that might that, that would be a good idea to do that and so you know that got me more and more involved in this whole topic I, I think I've stuck with it because frankly it's very painful uh, these situations are um, very painful for the family members and um, and I'm also intrigued by how much misinformation is published and so I've tried to go to town in uh, fighting back against the, the misinformation that we see so often. 
Absolutely. I really appreciate that too, because from my personal experience to learn about it and then realize that some people don't even take it seriously or believe in it. It's you think the gaslighting is done when you step away from the toxic parent and then you realize, oh, the U.S., the U.N. is gaslighting you. Oh, like these major organizations don't even believe um, that you went through is legitimate. So I really do appreciate you um, sticking to the truth and your convictions and the research, what the research shows. So to talk about the alienated child's position, I still consider it somewhat of a minor miracle that I figured it out. In your estimation, your honest estimation, what percentage of children go on to figure this out in severe cases, particularly? Oh, I think it's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. I, I think some of them get into um, treatment programs or or the judge uh, creates a treatment program by transferring custody from one parent to the other. And so that actually helps many, many children, simply that transfer of custody away from the alien 18 parent. But if it, if that doesn't happen, and if it continues into adulthood, I, I you know, I, I, I really don't know, but if I had to estimate, I would say that maybe 10% of adult alienated children figure it out and get reunited with the parent that they previously were alienated from. It does happen occasionally, like it, it, sometimes it's called spontaneously. Sometimes it happens spontaneously. Like if the, uh, if the alienated child, for instance, uh, gets involved in a relationship, like a, like a, uh, a, a partner and the partner says, Hey, well, you know, whatever happened that to the, your parents, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, one parent I met, the other parent doesn't seem to exist. And, mm -hmm. and so the, they, they start asking questions like that. And so sometimes that really helps the alienated child uh, see see what has happened. Absolutely. In your opinion, why, why do you think that more children, more adult children specifically, are not figuring this out? Well, you, you know, if there's something a person has been convinced of for years, 10, 15, 20 years, I mean, it's just not, it's just part of who they are and, yeah. and it's part of their thinking. And unless something triggers uh, them to think some other way, uh, it's not going to happen. And especially, you know, they, they've been told things that are untrue and they have this image of the rejected parent as a really horrible person. So why should they go to the trouble to try to contact that person? Um, so it, it is understandable that, that when you're fully brainwashed, you're mm -hmm. just stuck with that frame of mind and you're not going to listen to something else. Yes, I agree. That describes my experience. I know exactly what you're talking about. What, what would you say are the top three things that need to change in order for children to figure it out? Um, I think that it's... Uh, important to move away from the home that has been causing the alienation. So that frequently happens naturally. Children uh, grow up, they go away to college, uh, they, they create a whole new uh, set of contacts and trends. They get involved with a significant other person. Um, I think sometimes they hear about it like in some sort of speech or lecture, perhaps even a class in college. They, they might be taking some sort of uh, family therapy class or something like that, or psychology class, and it might dawn on them. And that happens in other kinds of situations too. For instance, children mm -hmm. who were abused, mm -hmm. children who were sexually abused, sometimes they go to college and, and they learn that about what happened to them, and it dawns on them that they had been sexually abused. So I think that happens with alienation also. Um, I think that something else that's, that's really important is education. And I think what you're doing is really, really important because you're aggressively getting the word out to hundreds or even thousands of people in, in really a short period of time. And I think that that word is going to percolate around and uh, kids will see it and they'll start asking about their own situation. Um, I, I'm sure there are other things that would be nice to change or improve. And one of them is the court system. I, I think there are some aspects of the court system that promote alienation because our courts are adversarial. And so when you go to court, one parent A 
complains about parent B and parent B complains about parent A. And so sometimes that aggravates um, or make, make stronger the alienation that's present. For all the people in my position trying to recover after figuring out the truth, um, what do we, the adult children, need to know in order to most effectively heal and maybe even achieve post-traumatic growth? Well, I, I would conceptualize healing as two big, big steps. The, the first step, is finding and talking to the parent who's been rejected all this time. Mm -hmm. And that's a big step. You know, the person would be afraid to do that or, you know, why go to the trouble to do that? And obviously the parent herself or himself would be cautious about hearing from that child. You know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you've been through that. And so I'm sure that you can give advice to both children adult children and parents, that it's a wonderful thing to see that happen. Mm -hmm. I, I think when it does happen, both sides need to sort of pace themselves and not and not sort of jump into uh, sort of making everything go away in a day. I think you have to have conversations and discussions and um, you have to think about the future. You shouldn't get hung up about what may have happened in the past and, mm -hmm. and so on. So that's one step. There's the other step, which I think is important also, I don't think it happens so much, is being able to have a healthy relationship with the, the parent A, the parent who was the alienating parent. It's, I, you know, I guess that would be nice to do if the end result were uh, that the person has a nice, comfortable relationship with both mom and dad. But I know that doesn't that, that that doesn't usually happen because usually, if the child finds the uh, parent B, the alienated parent, and goes and forms some kind of relationship with that parent, parent A is usually rejecting. Parent A says, "Well, I don't want to have anything to do with you. If you're going to go hang out with parent B, or if you're going to go hang out with your dad, I don't want to have anything more to do with you. So don't bother calling me up anymore." So. I think that to achieve that second step, I mean, everybody would have to take a big breath and really have some growth. Um, both parents would need to have some growth of the child. I think that would be a great thing, but I don't think that usually happens. I think that parent A would be rejecting if the child goes and tries to have a relationship with parent B. That's so interesting. I, I I was reading your research and I, I remember hearing that in your research too, that the amount of children that are rejected by their alienating parent or that the alienating parent tries to sabotage their new connection with their targeted parent. Have you seen uh, um, alienated adults who figure it out and decide to end the relationship with their alienating parent? I've had conversations with a few people who had kind of a minimal relationship with the with the favored parent, the person who's originally called the favored parent or the alienating parent. You know, like the person might touch base on or through siblings might say hi or might have a brief lunch, you know, every so often. I, I, I've heard that happen, but it, it, it um, meant, Maybe there are times when something deeper happens also. But my impression is that the alien 18 parent doesn't want to give up their way of thinking. And so they stubbornly reject um, any friend friendly comments from the child. Speaking about the, the alienating parent, what causes a person to do this? Um, you know, you can put it in different terms. I get, think on the most superficial level, the alienating parent is really, really angry, perhaps because of the circumstances of their divorce from the other parent that, that whatever happened made them really, really angry. And so this anger they take out through the child by saying, uh, I'm not going to let you have a relationship with our child 
and and so it's a it's a way to express anger. But that's that's kind of a superficial explanation. I think on uh, on the deeper level, there, there's a lot of research that, uh, especially alienating parents who might be classified as severe, severely alienating parents, have a real um, disordered way of thinking. They have unrealistic and um, a way of thinking about their lives and their children and other people. And the way of thinking is that they are very important and they're the most important person who can possibly raise this child and anybody else is not important, including the other parent. And it's a very self-centered, or I guess you might say narcissistic way of thinking. And people with uh, personality disorders where they think that way are just totally convinced. In other words, they're, they're convinced that their worldview is the correct worldview. And sometimes that might have come out of their own childhood. Mm -hmm. Suppose something happened in their own, their own childhood that might have been traumatic or a, a loss of a parent or a uh, pathological relationship with a parent. So in their own childhood, they, they develop these feelings where uh, you can't trust other people and anybody that you relate to goes through these stages. There's the, the splitting that happens um, that other people, some, some days you say, they're, they're the most wonderful person in the world. And two days later, they're horrible. People who have certain personality disorders tend to do that. So I think in some cases, the alienating activities are derived from that person's own past experiences and, and their own childhood. But I, in others, I think it's just another, a way of being really, really angry and, and vengeful at the other parent. I know that you classify some as naive, active, or obsessed alienators. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like from your research that the more severe, the active and obsessed alienators, they have some type of knowledge that they're hurting their child. Is that true? Well, they're doing it, yes, and they're doing it on purpose. In other words, the, the naive alienator might do a few things accidentally or in, occasionally. They're not this. They're not just totally determined to sabotage the child's relationship. But then the obsessed person is just determined to ruin the child's relationship with that other parent. And so sometimes those are people with a really severe personality disorder who might have developed that from their own childhood and are convinced that uh, they have to take care of this child because. You're de they're, they feel destined to take care of the child. Or sometimes it's a different kind of mental disorder. Sometimes it's a delusion that the alienating parent might have false beliefs or delusions about the rejected parent. And so they convey those delusions to the child. I think that's a different mental process. I think most people would consider the delusions to be more severe because in those cases, the person is, is really, really convinced of having a false belief. But in any case, the severe alienators of both categories are gonna be uh, very difficult to have an intervention with. Okay, I can relate to that. I, mine was severe and obsessed. It's funny that you mentioned the delusions because that was my next question, whether or not sometimes they believe the lies they're telling the child. And if they do, my question is, do you ever see any guilt for any of the damage they've done? Um, I think sometimes they come around. Um, even people with delusions occasionally settle down and they can think back and they, they, they understand that what they believed was a false belief. And sometimes psychiatric treatment can help them do that. Uh, I think the, uh, the intervention programs where the child is removed from the alienating parent, so at least for 90 days is the way most of them work. And during that 90 days, the parent is supposed to be working with a coach or a therapist. So those parents sometimes I mean, I mean, the coach, of course, comes right out and tells them that what they've been doing is very damaging. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it sort of dawns on the parent 
that yes, maybe I maybe I have been making a mistake. And so sometimes the parent does come around and uh, kind of admits that they had been making uh, a mistake and doing something that hurt the child. Sometimes I do do it under the uh, the influence of the court. For instance, the court is going to say, well, you can't even see your child again until you make some progress in uh, the damage that you've been doing. So um, that might motivate some people to uh, to understand what they've been doing. Okay, that's that's an, that's an, uh, a bit of hope. That's encouraging. A little bit. Um, I, you know, yes, it, it, there's a little bit of hope, and so I think it's always worth uh, trying to have an intervention for those parents, and uh, and and sometimes it works. Moving to the targeted parent, if we if we could. When a parent first thinks that their child is being turned against them, manipulated, brainwashed to, to fear them or hate them, should the targeted parent confront the pathological parent? And if so, how? You can try that. Uh, if you're going to do that, you need to figure out a way to do it without just creating a real big argument. Uh, I think... Uh, if you're referring to sort of milder cases, I think it is possible to sit down, like for a psychologist or a therapist, to sit down with both the mom and the dad and to, to try to understand both people's points of view and uh, try to understand what's been happening. And so I, I think if it's mild, you can do that, have that kind of discussion and try to get both parents on the same page, meaning that the child needs to have a good relationship with both the mom and the dad. So in the scenario that you described where the target parent is starting to realize this is happening, I guess what I'm hoping is that it's a mild situation and, and that it still um, might, be a, might, might be treatable. Uh, if, if the target parent doesn't realize that until it's way down the road, then it's not gonna be so easy. How would you advise the targeted parent to seek help uh, legally or um, practically, any actionable steps that parents can take? Well, the first step might be what, what I said is to have a meeting with a neutral person like a therapist or a counselor. I guess a higher level step might be to, to find an attorney who seems to understand what's going on. And, and the first level there might be the attorney writes a letter to the other parent's attorney and says, hey, oh look what's happening. Uh, this is very dangerous and damaging to the children. If that doesn't get anywhere, the next step would be for the attorney to go to court and try to explain it to the judge and see if the judge understands what's going on. So, you know, I, I think the steps start with relatively easy tasks and proceed to things that are harder. If, if you go to court and the judge, and many many judges nowadays understand this completely. I mean, I, I had a judge a few months ago who, who told me that he knew more about alienation than I do because he, he's been a judge for 40 years and he's seen many, many cases and he's seen more cases than I've seen. And I think he was correct. <laughs> so I think I think there are judges who understand this really clearly and and many of them are willing to take steps. You know, they, they admonish the parents or they adjust the parenting schedule, or, the, or they uh, insist on certain, uh, maybe on a coordination, a parenting coordinator. So um, hopefully, uh, especially if this is caught sooner rather than later, uh, it, it's, it gets turned around. That's some good information for people to have that are listening. Um, what about long-term, more, severely alienated parents. I've spoken to a few parents, actually more than a few, who've been alienated for 10, 20 plus years. Is there anything that you can, that they can do for reunification? Is, and is there ever a time to tell your child the truth? Well, of course, if you don't even have access to the child, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, in the really severe cases, the parent has lost touch with the child and the child has remained away and there's been no communication for years, 10 or 15 years, a long, long time. Um, 
it is it's generally suggested uh, that the parent try to stay in touch at least minimally you know send a birthday card or or send a gift if the baby if there's a baby born or something like that and it's those gifts and those cards are frequently rejected or just thrown out but it is almost everybody suggests that you might as well try to stay in touch at least in a minimal way you don't want to overdo it because if you try to stay in touch too much you're accused of being intrusive and stalking and whatever might else they might say mm -hmm. so uh, and then the uh, let's see i guess another strategy is to find some roundabout way for instance maybe through another relative or through a, uh, a friend that both you and the child know or through a cousin that the child still gets along with that you it, it might be possible to send a message um, and for that person to be kind of like a, a an intermediary and to help um, a, a, uh, some sort of meeting to happen. That would be that would be great. I, I, I wish that more of the extended family members would step in in these cases. It seems like there are many fragmented groups working to fight parental alienation. To, for anyone out there who has been impacted and would like to get involved, is there... Want a suggestion that you could give that, of where parents should focus their energy? I think it depends on what they need. Uh, like your website and your Facebook page is, is a really helpful resource just for everyday information. And mm -hmm. that many parents might tune in there and, and get very practical day-to-day uh, -day advice. Uh, there are also... Uh, support groups, you know, where people meet either in person or, or virtually, um, where there's a leader and they actively help people work through different issues. Mm -hmm. But it depends, the people have different interests. Some people get really involved in advocacy mm -hmm. and there are advocacy organizations that really try to change laws, try to change, um, or the, the way the government thinks about these things. Uh, the organization that I am the president of, which is called PASG, or Parental Alienation mm -hmm. Study Group, we're, we're, we're not a support. We don't have that kind of activity, but we do have lots of members who are interested in either running a support group or, or doing education or writing papers or giving presentations. And so, um, that's another way that a parent can help out that to, just in our organization, about half the members are parents or grandparents and the other half are psychologists and psychiatrists and attorneys and a few judges. So it's about half parents and half professionals. So, and we have meetings and, and we, we try to get people in touch with each other so that they can collaborate in projects. So that's, that's another thing. Some people want to do that. Um, to, to, to even do that, you kind of have to get past the initial shock of your situation. And so um, I think uh, alienated parents have different, are at different stages that they go through. And so that might affect what kind of organization they might want to hook up with. Sure. Um, and I'll make sure to leave the link to your organization in the description if parents are interested in in um, learning more or, or yeah, if they're interested they should just go to the website and then there's a button that says contact us and if, <laughs> if you want to join PASG or if you want more information you just hit contact us and say what you want that's great I'm really glad that that you have created that because it seems to be like the biggest most inclusive organization that I've seen it's kind of seems like it's the umbrella for a lot of a lot of people talking about just the system if you had to pick the number one thing that you believe can wake the public up to this what what do you think it would be of course what we've tried to do for years is education of the public and uh, and, and and professionals both mental health and legal professionals 
you know, like we've tried to get this topic taught in graduate school and then uh, training programs for psychiatrists and um, law schools for attorneys. Uh, so that that would be a great thing to accomplish. But that that kind of thing doesn't really change public opinion on a broad scale. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what we've had. Uh, some people have made really good videos. Mm -hmm. There are a number of videos out that uh, like feature length videos, mm -hmm. 60 minute, 80 minute videos. And well, it's called Erasing Family, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, and so that uh, that kind of information, I think, does get out to the general public. I'll tell you what would be really neat mm -hmm. is to have some sort of big production, extremely well done, dramatic mm -hmm. movie that portrays this in a very touching, um, dramatic way that goes through different painful activities, but hopefully has some sort of resolution. So it might not necessarily be a happy ending, but it has some kind of resolution at the end that makes people feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. That would be neat. And there's been discussion. I mean, we, we've had discussions of, of uh, we've tried to get funding, for instance, if somebody who, who wanted to donate several million dollars to, to make that kind of movie, <laughs> If any of your listeners happen to be interested in that kind of project, you know, let me know. But but that that would actually that would that it's sort of like Schindler's List type movie, mm -hmm. you know. Where it was a it, Schindler's List is about a part of history that was very ugly and the Holocaust, and but here's a movie that was about that that whole part of history, and, you know, and it was obviously very very successful. So. I, I think it'd be neat. That would really break the ice, and uh, for many, many people. Well, of course, you know, I think there are many other things. I, th I think what you're doing is fantastic because you're stirring up talk and discussion, especially among the, these adult children who need, who need somebody to have somebody to talk to, um, and the videos. So there's lots of things happening, but um, if you want something really block. Buster. <laughs> I, I think we need a Schindler's List type movie. I've I've been saying the same thing. Are there currently any state or federal laws that prohibit parental alienation? And do you think that parental alienation specifically needs to be a crime? Well, just to make the terminology straight, we use parental alienation for the end result that happens in the child. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the thing that would be a crime would be alienating behaviors. Okay. In other words, causing parental alienation in a child might be considered some kind of uh, crime. But there already are, I think almost every state has rules about this. Mm -hmm. Like every state has rules about uh, custody, child custody, and what to do if the parents cannot agree on child custody. And the, the rule states something to the effect, parents are not allowed to interfere with the child's relationship with the other parent. That, that's, I think that's a law in almost every state, but it's not, it's not implemented. Mm -mm. If you go, if you have that, if the parent is doing that to you and you go to the local police station and say, hey, they're breaking this law. Parents are not allowed to interfere with my relationship with my child. The, the police will say, oh, well, you know, we can't do anything about that. So some of that is already in place, but it simply is not acted upon. Uh, there, are, there are people who though are pushing on that. There are people who are trying to educate parents to go and find out what, what that law is in their jurisdiction and, and to take that law uh, the next time they have a problem to the local police station and talk not just to the policeman on duty, but to talk to the, the person who's in charge of, of that police force and say, hey, this is the law, Can, are we going to enforce it? So some of that has already exists. I'm not sure how much the federal government can do because things like this are typically left up to the states as, you know, things like family law type issues. Um, I think the federal government could provide funding for educating uh, therapists and attorneys and judges regarding this. They might, they might be able to do that. So that would be good. I should know the answer to this, but is custodial interference a 
is that a crime or is would that be something that's held, handled in family court or a criminal court? Well, I think it is a misdemeanor in many states to interfere with the child relationship with the other parent, but nobody implements it. That's what I was saying. Right. I think it exists. So it does, I think it does show up in family court uh, where uh, judges take that into consideration. Uh, perhaps that should happen more than it does. Okay. I know it's so tricky because the child believes it's their own decision. First of all, is there anything that you would like to add? What are maybe two or three takeaways that you would like people to, to really to know by the end of this conversation? People really need to um, do their homework. Uh, if anybody who's watching this needs to study up on this topic, there are many, many articles or books. There are, many, there are a couple hundred books about this topic, about half of them written by professionals and about half of them written by parents or children. Um, we, we have a whole list of books on our website. So I think one thing is to um, is to do your homework. Secondly, um, I think to have people that you can count on because it's a very difficult place to be a rejected parent. So you have to have your own network of friends and uh, family members who are going to back you up. And I think it's good to have hope. I think sometimes uh, this does turn around and, and your situation is a wonderful example of that. So those are my three messages. I love that. And I love that message of hope because I wrote out in my notes, I said, uh, with my videos, I always like to end on a hopeful note. And not to give parents false hope, but to continue the hope no matter what. Because if you don't have hope, I think the chances of you reuniting become significantly smaller. Yeah. Um, that's just my own belief. So I have one last question for you. In your research I study, the parental alienation science and law, I read part of the phenomenon of alienation on the effect of the child, which really resonates with me. You say the rejection of the hated parent becomes an internalized rejection and leads over time to self-loathing, fears of rejection, depression, and even suicidal ideation. And I was wondering if in turn, do you think that in reconnecting with the targeted parent and accepting them, loving them and accepting their their love too do you think that the children can eventually maybe dis dissolve some of that internalized rejection in other words do you think that acceptance of the parent down the line can become acceptance internally yes. for the child yes i think it can i think that what you're describing is a form of therapy of redoing things that have happened in the past and redoing them in a healthy way. And yes, I think that can be very therapeutic. Thank you. That's the phenomenon I'm encountering. And it's the most unexpected but wonderful thing no. to go through. I haven't heard many people talk about that as much. Thank you so much for um, your time tonight and also your efforts every day. As, again. Madison, th thank you very much and, and good luck. And with your projects, they're, they're a wonderful thing. It's a good way to go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support and your research and your life's work means the world to me. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take care. Bye. That's the end of this episode. Thank you everybody who was listening to not only this episode, but also other videos in my channel. At the end of the day, you can do whatever you want with your time. So the fact that you spent the time watching my videos, it means so much that you take the time to listen. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to my channel, sharing the episode with someone who you think could benefit from it, and supporting Dr. Burnett's nonprofit, the Parental Alienation Study Group. The link for that is in the description. It is my hope that this episode has been helpful for you in some way. As always, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate your time. I'll see you next time. Bye.